So I wanted to start, thank you all for coming tonight to hear about Lisa and her book and her fabulous and fascinating story. I want to start on a personal note by saying that a year ago, at this time, exactly right now, I was in the hospital where my father was about to die. And I'm sharing that, it's germane, only because it was after he died that I started a long process well, it's not been that long because it's only been a year, where I started to understand and am starting to figure out pieces of my family history. And my father was not an easy person um, and, and, and trying to make sense of family. And I wonder how many people here tonight are here in part because you're trying to make sense of your families. Anybody want to just raise their hand? Uh, um, so anyhow, it's, it was ironic timing to be here with you right now um, because Unlike my father, your father changed the world, and your father was a singularly, singularly unusual person. And on his deathbed, you seem to have spent a lot of time with him while he was dying. He said to you, are you going to write about me? And you said, no. What made you change your mind? Or did you know all along that you, think, that you thought you would? So that didn't... That particular moment didn't happen actually on his deathbed, I have to say. Um, and he was, I think he was watching Law and Order. And then he yeah. turned to me and said, are you gonna write about me? And I said, no. And I had actually wondered if it was going to happen, that moment was gonna happen before it happened because he obviously knew I was a writer. Um, and while I was hoping when I started writing this book that he would be boring on the page. He didn't turn out to be so boring on the page, and he might have known that about himself. <laughs> so, but um, the, the reason I said no is because I thought um, I was writing about myself, and, or I would write about myself if I, if I wanted to, and that um, people do have, I think they have the right to write their own story um, the difficult thing about memoir, I think, is that you, you necessarily drag a bunch of people into your net. Um, in trying to sort yourself out, you bring other people in, and you have a kind of moral obligation to do the best job with these people that you can. So my justification for myself was, no, I'm not going to write a book about you. I'm not a biographer. I'm not... Um, I know nothing about your business life, nor would claim to. Um, so that was what I said to myself. But the other thing I said to myself, and this, this shows that I'm really kind of actually a devious person and an actual writer, is that I, that I had read the wonderful book called Patrimony by Philip Roth. And there's a scene in there where his father says something similar. Please don't put this in your book. But of course, it's in the book. Um, and it's embarrassing. And so I thought, when I was writing this book, I thought, I have that scene. I have that scene. Um, I've got to put it in. So I did. <laughs> and I didn't take from that that he was necessarily not wanting you to write a book. It was, or did I read it wrong? It was he, he wasn't asking you not to. He was just kind of curious, like, hmm, maybe you will. So I would say he was definitely saying, don't. But he didn't say don't. Um, and then the other thing about this book is that uh, I haven't written it telling you what you're supposed to take from it. And I have heard different perceptions of different scenes, and maybe they're just as valid as... Most of them are just as valid as my own experience, so maybe he wasn't saying don't write about me. I don't know. <laughs> that was the feeling I got. So now's the next question. And this is a dumb question, because I'm a writer too. Why did you write this book? Because you didn't have to come out and tell your deeply personal story. Forget who your father was. So why did you subject yourself to anybody who's written about themselves? Anybody who's written anything knows it's not an easy feat. Yeah, someone asked me last night, why would you want, how do you feel having all of your personal stories out in the public world, in the, in the public sphere? And I thought, oh God, was, is it too personal? <laughs> Can I take it back? Um, no, that's why it's good. When it's personal, so, yeah. you know it's good. So it's very, um, so if you want to read everything embarrassing that has ever happened to me, um, that I've ever done, it's probably here. Um, 
I have come to an answer about why I wrote this book. It didn't start out, it wasn't so clear when it started out um, to me, except for that I think I felt um, like I wasn't allowed to write it, which was a curious feeling and made me want to dig deeper and also made me want to run away from it. Hmm. Um, and then, um, and then I also, sorry, this is the five and a half month year, the five and a half month old in me where I'm like, and then I'm losing my train of thought, but no. Um, so I felt as if I couldn't write it. I felt as if I didn't know whether I was allowed to occupy space. Um, I felt as if I was very ashamed, and I'm not sure how to give a name to the shame, but something about, did I deserve to be here? Was I legitimate? Um, there is a quality, I think, of being the, maybe the dark side or the um, less pretty side of a very beautiful story. Um, and I didn't particularly like that. Um, and so I was running from something I couldn't quite name, and I guess I kind of wanted to stop running from it. I wanted to slow down time and, and hope that if I did and if I wrestled with this feeling long enough, that I would come out of it feeling um, less afraid. So I think that I wrote it because I wanted to feel less illegitimate. Um, I wanted to feel like I could stand on this planet and, and belong somehow. The wonderful thing about feeling yourself in the inter inner circle of, of your life is that you don't have to write a memoir, <laughs> right? Because you're, you're comfy. So I just, it wasn't that I necessarily was ever feeling like I would be on the inner circle of anything, but that I wanted to understand why I wasn't, maybe. I wanted to, it, uh, rather than unraveling the knot, I wanted to look at it so carefully that it didn't haunt me anymore. And then the result has been, I feel more on the inner circle of, of my own life, um, more comfortable where I am. And I guess it's a funny thing that you would put all of your embarrassing stories and all of your shameful things and all of your devious things in a book and then come out of it um, feeling less ashamed and less devious. <laughs> so it worked. I guess so, in that sense, yeah. It's interesting when you were saying that too, I thought how interesting that you had a baby after that process, um, that you felt ready or uh, you know, the whole idea of parenting after writing about parenting and parenthood. My mother uh, kept on saying that you, you have to come to terms with your own story so that you don't accidentally repeat it which I think is a bit of a cliche, but she kept on repeating it. I thought, oh, it's such a cliche. Please don't make me write this embarrassing book. Can I please write something before this embarrassing book? Um, embarrassing because um, it's, the celebrity thing is so distracting. And, um, and I certainly did not want to pull all these people into my net who didn't want to be in this book. Um, so, and it was also just embarrassing to say me, I, I, me all of these times and to, to feel yourself so important that you would deserve a whole book. Um, but my mother kept on saying you need to do it. And finally I came around to the fact that it was important. And it was something about that. It was something about um, wanting to have a different kind of family. And I do wonder if I would have met my husband, um, the first person, that felt like a wonderful person to have a family with if I hadn't done this book. And I didn't meet him until the book started getting fun, which was about, um, I didn't meet him, I, we, you know, we met over three years ago, but that was when the book started becoming fun. It wasn't fun for the first many years. It was a slog of bad sentences and hiding from people and hiding from my phone. So you were completely locked away, making yourself, that was your primary focus while you were doing it in the beginning, the book was. Was that during your MFA or did you earn the MFA before? I started working on it a bit during my MFA. Um, 
but I didn't get my book contract until after, and I didn't kind of admit that I was really going to do it until after. Um, so, um, yeah, th it was just, let's see, I went to Bob's library and spent inordinate amounts of time writing bad sentences. I didn't really know how to write a scene. It turns out you can't write an essay for like 400 pages because <laughs> people will just give up in fury and hopelessness. You can't tell them how to think. You can't make them pity you if you are trying to manipulate them because they rebel, as they should. So I had to figure out how to write a scene. And then I felt as if, I, ho I heard Joyce Carol Oates say something like, writing a novel or writing a book is like, you're like in the middle of the ocean for a really long time with no view of land. <laughs> and I had never had that experience before. I, you know, I, I'd had essays and I'd mapped them out in my mind so that by the time I sat down, they sort of flew out of me. And I thought this book was gonna be like that because I didn't really believe in drafting because I hadn't been able to do it before. And everyone said, oh, you have to draft. And I kind of thought maybe they were silly or maybe they were stupid. Um, and, oh my God, did I have to draft? Um, oh my God, it did not come pouring out of me. And it turns out when you don't have the perspective yet, when you don't know who the writer is yet who's writing, um, the sentences are crap because you don't know what to exclude and what to include. So, um, so the reason I would have to kind of lock away my phone, well, actually, at first I would leave it at a cafe um, nearby, and I went in and talked with the women and said, I'm sorry, can I, leave my can I leave my phone with you? I find it distracting, and I'm trying to write a book, and they said, oh, we get it. And so I would leave it behind the counter, and then I had a landline, and, um, you know, and this made, and then at this point I was, I was dating again, and this made dating very difficult. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so I would lock myself away to try to write this, and, and I would know that I was writing badly for Which a long time, for part many of years. the process, too, right? But if you're doing it the first time and it's agonizingly personal, I can see how that would be disheartening. Yeah, yeah. it was agonizingly personal, and it also had this other quality where, because my father is so, um, so famous, uh, it was going to get published, even if it was terrible. And, and maybe it would even get some attention, even if it was terrible. And that was an added, that's a wonderful thing, but also, also a horrible thing, because in the end, if your book is going to get attention no matter what, or if it's going to get no attention no matter what, probably what, you sh what a person should be striving for no matter what is just to write the book that they, they are meaning to write. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of no shortcut but there was this terror of um, publishing too early and then uh, not having it, and letting it go too early into the world and having it be not the book it needed to be yet. Did you read your mother's book while she was writing it? Did you read your mother's book at all? Your mother wrote a book about your father too. Yes, I've been, I've been careful to avoid a lot of the media about my father, because again, he was my father, and so it seems a little bit irrelevant, and I'm not a Steve Jobs completionist. Um, I haven't, you know, I haven't watched all of his presentations. I didn't read the Walter Isaacson biography. I didn't watch the um, Aaron Sorkin movie. Um, Good, because it's got, it, it messes all the facts up, and I wasn't even there, so <laughs> it would and, drive you crazy. And I think the Walter Isaacson book wasn't, um, it wasn't fact-checked. This book was fact-checked. But this book would take a lot less time to fact-check. I don't mean lawyer-checked, I mean fact-checked, uh, which is different. You were, you were skeptical, because Walter, your father, asked Walter Isaacson to run around with him, right, at the end of his life, is that correct? Is that, I mean, he asked, basically, for Walter to write his biography, knowing that he was soon to die. Yes, I think that they enlisted Walter Walter's help, that they chose Walter. Right. But I asked my father when he was dying, actually, um, would you like me to talk to Walter? And he said, you can do what you want. And I thought, it's a tricky thing also when your parents don't get along and there's a biographer, because you don't know how the biographer is going to portray your parents, one or the other. And I have a friend who's a writer, and she said, if you have one scene with him, and at, this at the time, I didn't quite understand what a scene, what, what a scene was, 
but I, I have since learned. If you have one scene with Walter, you've given him some sort of legitimacy for his other perspectives, right? Then I suddenly were friends. Um, or even if we're not friends, he's describing me, I've given him some of, his, some of my time, and he in, then in the book can give the impression that I somehow again legitimize his perspective. And so I assiduously avoided him. I never met with him so you for were, that reason. I see, I see. But that is the difference between biography versus memoir, is that a biographer does a scan of a person's life. In this case, it was an unusual perspective because everybody pretty much was alive who he was talking to. I'm so cold. It is cold. I'm so cold. You know what? Is Somebody there, back there, I have a wrap in my cold? L.A. I'm public sorry. library bag. Darlene, can you get, I know, I noticed. Can oh, I, wait, we have um, a jacket we coming have. from the husband. <laughs> it's not my jacket, husband thank you. Is, excellent. <laughs> but it's going to be, it's going to work. It's very glamorous. <laughs> it's very glamorous. Um, sorry. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, a bi the difference between biography and memoir for anyone out there who <laughs> wants to write one. It's cute. <laughs> now you really look like you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> That's like she, the total welcome know. back, She's from Cotter. Brooklyn, Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was it was hitting the. Sorry. So okay. So you're back. To, okay. I, I hear you on the skepticism of Walter and not wanting to give up a piece of yourself, um, well, also, or giving him the license. When someone's doing a biography, you don't have any power or control over their final perspective. So they can portray you any which way. And so you didn't want to wait. Well, I've done that. that a little bit now since this book has come out, and haven't been thrilled with it, but have done it to publicize the book. I've done profiles where other people they meet with me and then they um, quote my book however they want, and they say what the book means. Um, they say what it, what they think it means. Um, with him, the stakes seemed too high, so I didn't meet with him. I also thought. I wasn't necessarily important or didn't want to be so important to his story. Hmm, that's not to play psychotherapist, but that's kind of curious because it's kind of hiding yourself when you were a very important part of the story. Well, I hadn't, oh, I didn't mean my father's story. I mean Walter's story. Um, so, but anyway, I mean, this is talking all about something I know nothing about which is a biography I haven't even read by a man I don't know. But, uh, but you were asking me about my mother's book. Yes, I, back I mean, to your mother. No, I, back I'm just saying I could talk for an hour about it, but the truth is I, I just don't know. Uh, my mother's book, I, um, I did read it, and I felt very lucky to have someone who's taken the time to write down so many details about my two parents meeting and getting together before I was even born in California. And there were things that she hadn't told me before that were in that book that were wonderful to read about. So I felt lucky. I mean, we should all have so much documentation and care put into our own, um, to the, the beginnings of our beginnings. I thought that was wonderful. And I loved some of her scenes and I thought there was a lot of sweetness in it. And I thought that the beginning was more moving to me than the end. Um, and I think it was, you know, it was just very different than mine. Um, and and I, I was, I'm, I'm, I feel lucky also that she did it because there was something about her going through the process of writing it before me, before I was done with my book, that she was able to help me with process too. Hmm. Um, not that I always believed her. I'm starting to wonder actually on this, on this book tour if I'm still quite adolescent in relation with my mother. <laughs> I feel like I've moved on from my adolescence in many ways, but perhaps I have more work to do. Um, but... Uh, how, how do you mean? How do you mean? Oh, just that I'm sort of still a little competitive with her and I, I still, um, you know, up the ante, <laughs> as daughters sometimes do with mothers, you know. She'll say this, and then I'll complain about this, and then she'll complain about this, and pretty soon we're in a little, a, a little tiff. I see. Um, so I'm not totally beyond that, even now that I'm a mother myself. But we'll get back to you on that in about ten years, right? When <laughs> yeah. 
Thomas is older. Yeah. So, so when she was writing her book, you had started this. Hers came out in 2000, 2012, I think it was. It was after Stephen I think passed so. away. Yeah. And, and you... I didn't you, actually read it for a while. I read it recently. You did? Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Because it's dedicated to you, and I wonder... I mean, it is, it is a beautiful story, and mm -hmm. even if it's like your book, if you took out who your father was, which of course is impossible to do, it's just a beautiful, very personal love story. Um, what is it that I'm not? What is it that you want people to think about your father when they read this, or is it more that you want people to think about you? What it, What was the goal in getting it? So I think that down. Um, one of the the things I try to do is that you know, when you're on a trampoline and you stay very still, and so the other person, oh, this is LA, probably lots of people have trampolines, actually. Um, <laughs> it's all we do big, out the here. The big ones, when you, can, when you can sort of double, triple bounce. But there's a way you can figure out if you stay very still um, at a particular time, the other person goes flying up. And um, so I was trying to write, I think, a universal story, and then it's, amazing how many particular details and how many sort of revelations one has to have about oneself um, for it to be general. When, I when you try to write something very, very generally, it doesn't seem very applicable, but then now you actually have the details of a life. And I think people can see themselves in the story. And so I wanted to let, after, you know, after a long time of working out how to, working out what my feelings and my perspective was on a lot of these stories, and I, actually just going through the process of remembering a lot of stories, which, which takes its own time. Mm -hmm. um, and then after, you know, and for every seven stories, perhaps there's one in the book. I probably, you know, I wrote so many books for this book because stories would lead to stories would lead to stories, and then I would have a whole constellation, but perhaps, you know, uh, only not every story would, some stories would, would duplicate meaning and some stories wouldn't be necessary in the end. Um, but um, I have enjoyed how people see their own complicated families in this story. I think it can be distracting that my father was so famous and but people are seeing past that now that they're actually reading the book. I think the excerpts of the excerpts were distracting, perhaps. But now people are seeing, I think people are seeing their own stories in it and the complicated people that they love. And the experience that I've had is people who have um, stories with their own father see their own father and their relationship with their father in it. Last night there was a woman who is a single mother and she was actually she was crying about her own experience as a single mother in relation to my mother, so she wasn't seeing the mother-daughter story more. Hmm. Um, so I've tried, after years of work, to sort of step back and let people have their own emotions about it. That has some consequences for me, which is that sometimes people interpret it in a way that I didn't necessarily mean or that I don't feel about my family. And the way that I've come to terms with this is that when I've read a novel, maybe, um, that I love um, at a certain point in my life, I have, I have feelings about the characters in relation to my own life, and, and then I read it maybe a decade later, and it, it's, it's a completely different book, but of course it's not a different book. <laughs> it's just the same book. And so I'm trying to give that to people, just their own emotional experiences, and I'm using my story as that springboard and the only consequence is, is that people are having their own experience with my life. And um, so I've had to sort of let it go, you know. It's my life, but actually it's, it's your book. It's one thing for people you don't know to read your book and to see your deep personal feelings and experiences, but it's another for your family. Your mother right. even said, um, that it was searing. I'm using a word that she probably didn't use. But I think she said it, horrific. Horrific, but <laughs> that it was accurate. But it, that it was accurate. Yeah, she was. She. But that I you got a lot of midnight texts. 
while she was reading it. It was very intense. And I worried she might not finish. And then she finished, and I thought, God, what courage. Um, and we really did have a hard time. And she says, in some ways, it was, it was harder than I wrote. Right. But she also said that I didn't pull punches, and that was a high compliment, I think. When I started writing the book, um, she was glossed over, and my friend said, my friend I've known my whole life said, maybe you should just go for it, and then later you can cut. So then I went for it. And it was hard, it felt like I was killing her. I mean, it felt like a very violent act to actually write out how tough things had been and how hard she had been. And then later there were certain parts that I did pull back a bit. But I didn't pull any punches in the sense that I think I've represented her accurately. And um, I'm trying to get all the dark and all the light. And I think I got, I got there. And that was hard for her to read. <laughs> and um, I certainly didn't want to cause her pain. So. What about Steve's wife and your brother and sisters? What did you imagine their reaction would be? Or did it, I mean, I think to write a good memoir, we have to not care about what anybody else is going to think, including the people most closest to us. Yeah, I was, I was reading Philip Lopate, who I really admire and who's quoted on the front of this book, mm -hmm. um, and who's been a great mentor to me, and who does wonderful personal essays and, and writes about the personal essay, was asked who he writes for. And he was saying once it was kind of a group of nameless, faceless people who were benevolent toward him, who <laughs> gave him the benefit of the doubt, but were a bit, a bit curmudgeonly, maybe had a sense of humor, and were wise. And I think that's probably who I've been writing for. I don't write for a specific person. Some group of people, maybe I'm writing for you, because I can hardly see you <laughs> past the light. Um, and so, so I certainly did not picture my family members reading the draft as I was writing. At the same time, I think there's a lot of joy and kindness and light and, and um, affection. I found so much affection as I was writing. Um, and so I was spending time with a lot of people while they weren't spending time with me, which struck me later. I was quite isolated. I, I had to sort of lose touch with a lot of acquaintances because I couldn't keep up my relationships so well. Um, because it took, again, a lot of time to write very, what were initially quite bad sentences. Um, and so I didn't, yeah, so I did, anyway, so I didn't picture my family reading it. And, and my reaction afterward, um, you know, has been that I, you know, I've been written about, and since I was, since I was little, since I was three, there was that Time Magazine article, which I obviously wouldn't have known about, and then movies and books and these things we've been discussing. And so certainly, I do believe, even though I have personal experience with the fact that it's quite difficult to read about yourself from someone else's perspective, um, I do believe that uh, people do have the right to write their own story. And so that, that was a belief that grew stronger in me over time that I had to cultivate. And that's how I've sort of come to terms with the reactions that I've had. And the other thing is that I feel as if I've been um, not fair, because that's not a literary word, um, but I feel I've been honest. And, and kind. Kind, I guess, isn't a literary word either, but I like it. Um, <laughs> So I felt as if I'd been honest and kind, and, and, and to me that justified it, that justified. And then, you know, if you read the book, I'm completely devious. Um, I'm human and mischievous and scrappy and trying to get what I want um, and trying to use what I've got to feel okay about myself. And so this is not a person, I guess, who would shy away from writing about others if it felt important to her. But are you concerned, I mean, that there, there's not any 
are you in touch with them? Will they talk to you? Is, there, is this a fissure that this has created because of their reaction to the book? I honestly don't understand it, but I'm not them. So, because um, they do. I think my stepmother plays a sort of important role in the book. I think you can see that she's quite lovely and also she plays a kind of tonic note at a certain point. Yeah. Because she's dry and I kind of like that. Um, and hopefully she will too someday. And um, my aunt was actually quite, quite helpful in the making of this book. Um, at a certain point she read a draft and was very insightful with her comments. She, she was hoping for more of my mother's character as well and not necessarily more by volume, but there was a certain thread when I'd moved over to my father's house, a certain point when the thread of my mother's career had been lost that she wanted me to bring back. Another thing that she talked about when she read it was that some of the words that I used when I was a girl were too complicated for a girl to use. And I'd been holding on to these words because I didn't want you to think I wasn't, wasn't a good writer or that I wasn't intelligent. Um, so I thought, like there's a word etiolated. And I thought, it's just the perfect word, it's gotta stay. Um, but of course a young girl would not know the word etiolated and while I do play with different perspectives, the adult perspective is also together with the girl in the book. Um, it was helpful to have her feedback um, about cutting these words out. But were you surprised since she read the book while you were in process that at the, once the book came out that she joined with Laureen to say we're disappointed or the language that they used to, I guess it was a joint statement sort of issue to the press. It sounds so much like a joint statement, did it? It sounded a little tacked on. Um, so I was curious about how that was formed. I also thought that the phrasing was interesting of the statement because um, in the book I talk about there's a, a certain phase of my life when my father kept on saying, um, if you want to be part of this family, if you want to be part of this family, um, you'll do this and you'll do this. And, I'm sorry, I keep on hitting. And, and, the, and the, the statement sort of had similar phrasing, so I thought from a writer's perspective it was quite interesting. She if was you, responding to your, yeah. If you want yeah. to be part of this family. Um, so I, I think that's all I have to say about that. That's, I think that's the end of the interesting things I have to say on that. Okay. But they never reached out to you directly, it was just this statement? That thought that was interesting, too. Um, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like weaving and dodging as much as I humanly can. <laughs> and the memoir is not all about this, I promise. Um, let's see, the... Um, I think the statement, the statement is phrased in a quite an awkward way, and I think it, it came in quite late. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know about it until after it had been published. But Does no that direct, answer your question? No direct <laughs> contact. I have anybody who writes a memoir, I wrote a memoir, anybody who writes a memoir wonders if somebody mentioned in the book is going to come. Actually, I write a, wrote a biography and most of the people were dead and I also wondered who's going to come out of the woodwork and say, that's wrong, you got it wrong, and people have. Your family members so, didn't call you or did, did they just issue a press release to the New York Times? I don't think there was anything specific that was mentioned. Actually, what's happened to me, to be really honest, is I have had so many people come up to me and say, that was exactly right. I haven't had a single person come up and say that's wrong. So I don't know if I've made myself so vulnerable in the book that people are just trying to support me. <laughs> um, but my dad's ex-girlfriend, my friends in elementary school, in high school, my friend's parents, my mother's ex-boyfriends, my, I sent my mother the draft and she, um, she said, I think she, this is part of when she got upset, she said, you have it wrong, we didn't live in all those places. And I had carefully prepared for this possibility um, over years, in fact, just making sure of all the places we lived. I visited all the places we lived. And um, so I said, oh, really? Uh, let me send you the list. And I sent her the list, and I had them all. I had them all down. 
including you know places we'd lived only for two weeks. So, um, and then you know, Tina's cousin has come up to me and said, That's exa that is exactly the way that I remember it. One thing that Tina said, Your father's my ex dad's ex-girlfriend ex -girlfriend said, she said, I'm more interesting than I am in your book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> She's very interesting in the Isaacson book, so. And I think she actually is kind of wonderful in my book, but she was saying, but the thing is, you've got it right, and I like my character in the book. She sort of, would crouch up in the back of my dad's Porsche um, so that I could sit in the front with him. And, um, and, I, and she said, of course I understand that this isn't a book about me. This is a facet of my character that you as a girl knew. And so that's why it's okay, you know, that, I'm, that, I'm, that, I'm, that the fullness of my character that my entire life experience is not represented in your memoir, <laughs> you know? Um, it's the, your memoir, it's right. not anybody else's. The other thing that happened is that I've been doing readings, and I had a reading the other night at my high school, and I think almost everybody that was in the book was there. <laughs> like, Including um, your stepmother and brother and sisters? No. Okay. <laughs> Oh, it's like trying to take the bone away. Sorry. Um, it's okay. Sorry. It's, it's okay. my job. It's okay. Um, so, uh, no, but my, all my, you know, I, all my teachers were there and my friends from high school and my babysitter, one of my babysitters <laughs> who I do not remember um, from when I was um, three was there and my librarian who was in the book was there and the English. And then I thought, you know, when I came, I thought I'll read a passage about Palo Alto um, because they'll, they'll love hearing about their town, but um, my town. But um, the passage has, you know, I guess one of the best ways to capture a place is to be really in love with someone there. And so, so I read the, the scene about my high school boyfriend and how in love we were, and, and, um, and he was there <laughs> with, his with his wife. So, uh, <laughs> so that was terrifying and wonderful, but I think, I talked with a bunch of people. I, again, I didn't want to pull punches, but I also wanted to get it right. And I wanted to be kind. Because I think, you know, as much as people say, people probably say this in Hollywood, and I think this to myself, and I like this phrase that, and to apply it to myself, that, you know, if you're being evil, you never think of yourself as the evil character, you know? Um, but I think the other thing to think about about human beings is there is usually some deep kindness underneath their actions. And if you can find it, you can kind of unlock them. And so I did try to work at that, you know? Um, and so I do think that people's humanity is represented. So I haven't really had pushback that way. I mean, you know, and I also, it's part of the reason I wanted to get it fact-checked is I just thought, let's not get caught up on things that aren't right. Let's make sure it's, it's actually factually right and then I can hang my experiences and my emotions on that. And then the, the, I guess the one last thing I'll say, <laughs> clearly I have no trouble like running with a question, but the one last thing I'll say is... Um, You'd be a good politician. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, until You're you read the nice, book and then right. you think, oh, it's too embarrassing. You can't. Um, is that in order for me to expose other people and, and show the moments when they weren't as graceful, and they weren't as kind, I had to do that to myself as much as I could. Um, and in fact, that was the luck of this book. When I first started writing it, I just wasn't appearing on the pages. I, was, I would write a scene and the other people would show up, but I was gone. And so it's kind of a good metaphor for perhaps why I needed to write it in the first place was to start to appear. Mm -hmm. And I only started to appear when I did bad things or embarrassing things. Um, and at one point when I was writing this book, I read Tobias Wolff's This Boy's Life. And the more I noticed, the more devious he was, the more naughty, the more you know, criminal he was, um, the more I loved him, the more I loved young Tobias. And that sort of, that was the beginning of kind of unlocking the way to write this book. Hmm. was to find my own 
deviousness and shame and embarrassments and bring them out to the light and understand them. And then that gave me permission to kindly and charitably, but honestly, look at the other people in my life. You ask a question in the book that really touched me, and I think it's unanswerable, but I'm gonna ask you to answer it anyway. How close should we be to our fathers? You didn't write it exactly like that. Something like that. Yeah, there was a moment, um, there was a moment in Japan when he surprised me and came to visit me. And, um, and it was this wonderful time because we were like, you know, we were two people getting to know each other and we really liked each other, which is, which is such a surprise if you get to know someone later in your life and such luck. And it was so fun and, you know, he was so charismatic and so kind and so dear and fun. And we were sitting alone and talking to each other and at a certain point I was sitting on his lap and, um, and I'm feeling a little embarrassed because I used to often, um, sorry, I'm just dealing with this cold. I used to often dig my, sort of when I'd sit on my mother's lap, she'd say, oh, you're digging your butt bones into my thighs. Um, I think they're, they're called ischia bones or something. And I, I was sitting on his lap and I didn't know him very well, so I certainly didn't want to hurt him um, or alienate him. So I'm like trying to sit carefully, but I felt overwhelmed by this kind of ecstatic love. And I thought, um, you know, how close, are, how close are you supposed to be with your father? Um, I'm sure it's very Freudian, but I remember thinking, I don't know where this balance is. And thinking at a disadvantage, perhaps to other girls who, having fathers all along, would have known how you're supposed to feel at that point. It was another journal entry I found that's in the book, something like my mother was dating a man named Ron at the time. Um, who I actually saw last night, because <laughs> um, he was there as well. Um, <laughs> and uh, she was dating this man named Ron, and I wrote in my journal, uh, I love my dad, uh, not Ron, Steve Jobs. I love him, I love him, I love him. You know, this was when I was nine. Um, I think that I must have imagined him a particular way um, and he had to be better than, he had to be realer than real, he had to be better than other fathers because I'd waited for him for so long. Hmm. And then when he came into my life, in some ways he was, and that was so exuberant for me and so shocking. It was almost, um, the electricity was too high for the instrument to contain it. And you know, he was dashing and he was charismatic and he was handsome and we liked each other and he was, he was young and he was famous and, and he had a mansion and he drove a Porsche and it was just, you know, some of the things ended up being real and some of them were just shiny, but it was, it was, it was glorious. But I want to talk about this boyfriend, Ron, again, because I was just thinking, um, he wrote me an, an email, actually, and he said, he titled it Correction. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is the one time I thought, this is the one time, you know, I've received this. An actual, well, I thought I was going to get an actual note. Um, and I thought, oh no. And my husband was out and I thought maybe I should wait till he gets back in case this is bad. Because I was, I was a little tough on Ron. Um, and he said, you know, it seems that you've gotten a lot of the scenes right. A lot of the things that you've written about are exactly as I remember them, the houses we lived in, you know, the fact that I work at NASA, he still does, and, and the day we spent together looking at the flight simulators and all of that. And he said, but I have to make one correction. When you said that I, what was it, that I had swollen lips like a fish, <laughs> and I walked like a duck with my feet splayed out, and I had a bald head with tufts of hair on the side like a clown. I have attached a photograph of myself for you to use, <laughs> for you to use in, in future um, correspondence uh, so that you'll understand how I look. And he attached, <laughs> he attached a photograph of Fabio. <laughs> 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 um, but 
I did do some soul searching after that. I thought, oh my God, this poor man, why did I say he looked so bad? And then I realized, oh, I said he looked so bad because this is the moment he is walking in to go on a date for the first time with my mother. I hated him. So it was infused with my perspective, which is um, more true than true in a certain way. And can I, should I, can I read that I was that just going to say, perfect segue, right? yeah, yeah. All right. Can you set the scene up? Yes. Just, well, you sort of just did, but... I know I did, right? Yeah, you did. That was kind good. Of an accident. You've done this before. No, no. No, never. I've never read this scene before. You are um, lucky or unlucky, depending how you feel afterward. Um, my mother was supposed to go on a first date with Ron. He would come to pick her up, meet me, and they would go to an early dinner. The neighbors were home if I needed anything. I was old enough now, seven, to stay alone in the house for two hours, but the details were still in negotiation. She would have been arrested now, right? But <laughs> this was a while ago. <laughs> it was fine, we had neighbors nearby, it was fine. And afterwards, I was supposed to be in bed before she returned. I guess we might come back, she said. I made her promise they wouldn't go into her room, and for some reason, she agreed. Since she'd become interested in Ron, she no longer paid attention to me as astutely, I thought. She no longer consulted the I Ching. She was half absent with happiness, the same slight smile on her lips as when she ran up the hill to get the prickly pear. It was between boyfriends, between the loneliness and despair that followed one and the lift that began at the next, where I hoped to stay forever. She and I, the only team, the real couple. On the night of the date, Ron arrived on time. She was leaning over the bathroom sink doing her makeup when he knocked. I ran to open the door. I saw right away that Ron wasn't a hippie. He was bald, with hair tufted on the sides like a clown's, and had wide, bushy eyebrows, glasses rimmed with gold, and large, swollen lips like a fish. He looked clean and smelled of soap and detergent. Hello, I said. I'm Lisa. My mom's getting ready. Nice to meet you, he said, holding out his hand. He followed me into the living room. I noticed that as he walked, his feet splayed out dramatically to either side. My mother called from the bathroom. I'll be out in a minute. As we passed the bookshelf, I reached for an album of photographs of my birth. This was unplanned. It surprised even me, one arm jutting out as if I didn't have control of my limbs, and pulled it out of its socket on the shelf. I'd asked her to get rid of this album many times, and she refused, bringing it with us as we moved from house to house. The cover was made of brown woven grasses, and because it was old, the grasses had started to fray at the edges. To me, too, this hinted at the shame of the contents. I suspected other children didn't have shameful books like this around in their houses. He and I sat down on the flowered couch beside each other. I want to show you something, I said, just some photos of my mother and me. I opened the book across my lap where he could see it. My mother, younger, lying on a bed with dark hair like dark water pooling around her face. These were the pictures of my birth in black and white with rounded corners. She had what looked like a man's shirt buttoned around her chest and she was naked from the waist down with her legs bent and open in the foreground of the photo. I turned the page. There I was, emerging from be between her glowing white legs there I was, emerging from her between her glowing white legs like a turtle rising up from a pond. In the following pictures, once I was out, you could see my body wrinkled, my face wax white, asymmetrical, and squished. I felt refulsion and disgust, and yet I continued to turn the pages. I would not have known how to articulate it. I wanted to disgust him the way I was disgusted, to scare him away, to show him who we were, so that he might leave now, rather than wait. And here's more, I said, in my sweetest voice. Yes, he said, I see. He made no motion to rise and run. He sat, glancing at the pages and then looking away as if distracted. When my mother came out of the bathroom and saw us, she snatched the album from my hands and stuck it back in its place on the shelf, giving me a furious look. <laughs> See, 
Well, she's not here tonight, so I <laughs> thought I'd just read it. <laughs> that was good deviousness on your part. Okay, we have to get ready for questions, but before we do, I, I, we, Ted will come around with the microphone. I have to ask you one last question. What would your father think about this book? I know you don't have a crystal ball, a mind reader, all that kind of stuff, but what do you, what do you think? Um, I have several different answers for that. I don't know. I really don't know. And um, I was talking last night about something that I find quite interesting, which is that when he was apologizing to me um, before he died, he kept on saying, I owe you one, I owe you one. And there was one thing I realized when I was reading this book. It was such an odd phrase, I owe you one. I hadn't heard him say it before, ever. Um, and he, yet he kept on saying it then and crying. And one of the wonderful things from writing this book is that I got my own revelations. Um, one thing I thought when I left for college, um, he sort of dropped out of the world for me and I didn't know why and I didn't know what I'd done wrong and it was just hard. Our contact after that was quite hard for many years. And it was only when I was writing this book that I kind of realized that one of the things that happens between parents and children over time is I think that you get used to distance and closeness in this pendulum. The distance gets greater, the closeness stays, the distance gets greater, maybe the closeness gets more profound, and then finally, I guess, at some point, hopefully, they go away. <laughs> and I have very little experience with that so far, obviously. I mean, he was in our bed for a while, and now he's in his own room. Um, but uh, I felt when I was writing the book, I realized, oh, we didn't have any experience with this pendulum of distance and closeness. And when I went away, I think I might have hurt his feelings. And um, I do believe that some of those, those revelations and those understandings that I came to, um, some of them may be quite true. And I think both of us would have, would have benefited from understanding them. And I think he would have been joyful about that, or the, the side I know of him that I particularly liked would have been happy about that. But he was so careful about his own reputation and about his own image that, in, that I don't think this book would have necessarily appealed to that part of him. <laughs> um, although um, I certainly don't think he comes off worse and certainly not less human than anywhere else. And so in that way, I think I might have done him an honor. And then there are so many joyful moments that aren't represented in other places that he and I had. And so that I, I had this little trick that I play in my mind, which was that when he was saying, I owe you one, I owe you one, I thought, well, then I'll take this, that I get to write a book that's true and, and that that that's okay. But of course, that's my own devious imaginings and doesn't necessarily correspond with how he would feel. Thank you. Thank you. All right, time for questions from the audience. Just a quick reminder, at Live Talks LA, questions typically start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. They are generally short. There is no such thing as a two-part question, and only Lisa Napoli gets to ask follow-up questions. Uh, hi, Lisa. Um, hi. Nice to meet you. You too. So um, I understand what you say about writing a book about yourself. I'm a filmmaker from Spain. I wrote a book about myself a few years ago. It's all well, but only in Spain, fortunately. My question is, uh, how did you feel before, before you wrote the book? Because in my case, I was a bit scared to expose good things, bad things about me, about the people I deal with. Was you it your case? I was paralyzed with fear. I think I lost years. I think part of the reason this took so long is because um, because I was so afraid of everything. And also part of the reason I had to kind of isolate myself to write it 
and really put on hold having a full life, put on hold um, having a family and seeing friends a lot was because, and even covering up the mirror sometimes when I would go somewhere else to write, because when I'd catch myself in the mirror, I felt so badly about myself that it would distract me from my writing and I would lose time. Um, it was, sh shame is a terrible, paralyzing thing, and also imagined realities of how other people will perceive your work. But it's interesting because you're an artist, so I find that interesting. I mean, you're making, you're making, you're exposing yourself and putting it out into the world with your films. Um, so I think, in some ways, memoir I imagine is some of the same process. Yeah, very terrific to tell about yourself. Sorry, I'm I'm the one who made him do the two-part question. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Wait, it's it's you're telling about yourself. I have gotten the book now to the point where I think of the people a little bit like characters, not because they're not so true, and not because I don't feel like I have distilled them and captured them, but because it doesn't include all of them, and it doesn't include all of me either. Um, so I have a kind of, it's funny, it's, it's like I've exposed my embarrassing moments and my, and my scrappiness so much that now I, I don't feel so worried about anything else coming out. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Hi. Um, it's an honor to hear you tonight. Um, I, uh, forgive me, I haven't read your memoir yet. I'm looking forward to it, especially after reading just the first few pages. It's, it's amazing. And uh, I thank you for sharing yourself. Um, to get to the question, as I'm being prompted, um, <laughs> I'm curious what caused you to gravitate towards your father later in life. And is it because of your own inner motivations? Was it issues that you had with your mother or was it that you felt possibly even anger, if, if that's the right word, over having not been as connected with your father as you know, any girl would want to be growing up? How can you, how can you address that? Because you... I think it's all of those things. Um, but I also think that it wasn't so clear cut as it might seem from reading, I don't know, there, there, have been excerpt, there was an excerpt of the book that was actually several different things jammed together, and I was trying to give Vanity Fair some of the candy that they wanted. So it was perhaps a bit, um, it was very condensed. And then that excerpt was excerpted. And then, those ex uh, you know, and then those excerpts were excerpted. So I think we're gonna come finally to a single word. <laughs> but um, the book is more balanced, and I think, my life was more balanced in the sense that I didn't, you're asking why I gravitated toward my father, but when I heard that question, I thought, why I didn't give up on my father? Um, if he'd been so abandoning early in my life and so difficult at different points, why I didn't, why I kept on returning um, to have a relationship? And, I mean, if that, I think if that sounds somewhat reasonable. Um, and I was asking myself the same thing at the time, and sometimes it was disruptive. And sometimes it felt like I, I mean, I was doing everything I could not to feel like I was sycophantic in any way, because I really wasn't interested in his public life. Um, I was interested in him as a father, and the, and the truth was, when we had a good connection, it was actually wonderful. And the frustrating thing about that was, it was so wonderful that you thought, why can't this stay? Why does it always have to click out of place and get disjointed again? So I, I think I kept on returning because I kept on feeling as if there would be some sort of resolution or some sort of connection. And, and there was sometimes. And the hilarious thing to me, well, I guess it's not hilarious, but just that I kept on waiting for this Hollywood moment. And at the same time telling myself those don't happen. You know, in Jane Austen, they happen. Um, there's that wonderful scene in Magnolia with Philip Seymour Hoffman, which is kind of meta, where he's saying, this is the scene, you know the scene in the movies? But he's in the movie. Um, 
And so I thought, well, maybe if there's a meta scene about that kind of scene, maybe it happens sometimes where people come to resolution before they die. And so toward the very end of my father's life, I was kind of returning for that moment while being terribly embarrassed to be returning for that moment. And then we had that moment. We had that weekend, I guess. Um, Why were you embarrassed? Because this is real life and not the movies. And so I didn't think it would actually happen. And I didn't want to be one of those people that hangs around for the resolution with a famous person, you know, which is like, it was my father, but he was really difficult, and when he was standoffish, it felt like I was kind of I, a hanger on, and I didn't, I mean, I think he would have liked it in some ways if I'd lived in Palo Alto, but I always lived quite far away because it was difficult to live close by and have that intermittence that I'm talking about. But the reason I moved in with him in high school um, was that my, mo my mother and I were getting in terrible fights, and it became necessary. And I don't think it was an ideal time. My brother had just been born and wasn't sleeping through the night, so nobody was sleeping through the night. And sleep deprivation does crazy things to people. Um, so, so, that was a, so there was a mix of necessity and, and, and longing and wishing and, um, and confusion, I think. All right, we have time for two more questions. Hi. Um, oh, do I hold it? Oh, you. Um, hi, Lisa. Um, um, I'm actually from Palo Alto myself. I went to high school with you. That we don't, uh, we didn't know each other at the time, and I knew, I knew Stephen Lorene um, through a different route. Um, and I'm really curious. There's, there's so many parallels between. Wait, your we went to high school together. We did. Yeah. Oh, hi. I was two years older than you. You were in my younger oh. sister's class, but we, we, we know some mutual people. But we'll get back to that. Later. Um, there are so many parallels in the experience that you had with your dad that I was simultaneously going through. Um, and it's too bad we never met back then, um, including the timing of when I moved in with him and his stepmother and all of that. Um, I put myself through college, I left, and I left Palo Alto, and the last conversation I had with my dad was, uh, he didn't have time to say goodbye, I'll come, you know, I'll, I'll, one day we'll, you know, I, I'm too busy to say goodbye, but I'm sure we'll speak one day in the future, and we never did. We were estranged from then on. I found out a couple years after the fact, as of tomorrow, he, he actually had passed, um, and so I never had that Hollywood moment you literally just described. And I've been going through the past few years, um, a, uh, the same journey that you've discussed. So we're getting to it. Um, in terms of, I know I'm meant to write about my whole arc. Um, and I've been, just as you described, the paralyzation, the fear, everything you've talked about tonight is what I've been going through. So my question here, because you're going is... Um, it takes forever. How, do, how did you then finally walk through that? Because I feel like I'm going through this turmoil now of what is that step then that finally got you to, to write it? And what best advice would be? I guess is what I'm saying. Oh my goodness. Sorry, I don't think there's that. enough time that's to... Amazing. <laughs> just, that's amazing. You can't distill the process that you went through for over seven, for your entire lifetime. I'm going to seven try. Years. She okay. deserves it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I didn't think I would be this kind of person. People told me you're going to have to write a lot of drafts. And I thought, no. Um, the reason I had to write a lot of drafts is because there are so many moving targets. You're writing about yourself as a person who's changing through time, and the writer is changing through time. And it's like two different trapeze artists. I'm like, I'm making this metaphor up on the fly. But it's like two different tra trapeze artists, and where is the point where you, where you fix it? Like, in what? But that didn't really work. Oh, well. Um, but where is the point where you, where you fix it? So I, I anyway. Um, Isolate yourself from your, from your phone a little bit because it brings up, because when you're having a hor horrible writing day, it gives you instant gratification and writing is not instant. And so it's a, on a different time scale. Reading helps, I think, because you can get a, the rhythm of other writers and remind yourself of your own rhythm. Do you find that to be true? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it reminds you that writing is important. Um, because it can seem unimportant sometimes. And then um, extreme amounts of time and taking gentle care of yourself. Um, I'm sure I will think later of something I should have said, but
but I think that that's a good start. And I think, just to jump in, that reading this book helps, will help you a lot. And then finding your own, finding your own naughtiness, maybe your own badness, your own shame and deviousness, and the times where you have caused different things in your life. At least for me, that unlocked the story, because then I wasn't, I was in the scenes instead of just watching them. And our final question for the evening. So my family system has always been conditional, so I was especially intrigued when you said your father would say to you, if you want to be part of this family, you must. So I'm just curious if, you wouldn't be, if it wouldn't be uncomfortable for you to share some of the things that he insisted that you do in order to become part of the family. I'm so sorry, but you're going to have to read the book. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if you want to get the answer to this, you're going to have to read the book. No. Um, I, I think it's hard to love people sometimes if you can't control them a little. And I think that that's what happened. Um, fierce love, confusing love met, met adolescence. Um, so that's the backstory. <laughs> I think I, you know, I wanted to be free and be a teenager and stay at the paper late and do all these things late and, and then I wasn't around the house as much and um, maybe wasn't forming a family as much. Um, Maybe my father was trying to make up for some of the time that we missed and was hoping that I would just be around the house. Maybe he was worried about me. And so I described it a little bit like he wanted me to be around the house, but he didn't always have time to spend with me. And that's a tough situation to be in, to be kind of hanging around someone. It's almost worse than just not, it's worse than if they're not around, actually. Um, but he would say, you know, you need to be pulling your weight. You need to be around more. You need to be part of this family. Um, but then I did terrible things like I, I left my bike unlocked in Palo Alto and went into this clothing shop to, to look around when I was in high, early high school, I think. And the bike was obviously stolen. I think I'd had another bike stolen before that. So I think I knew what happened when you left a bike on a sidewalk like that. Um, and I sort of thought, well, he's rich. He can get me another one. Like, he's also saving money because I'm not going to the private school anymore, so a bike. Um, so it was also my entitlement met his reasonableness. Like, Lise, uh, this is how the world works. I don't know if he should have used the phrase if you want to be part of this family, but I think maybe that was, maybe that was what he knew I wanted so much that that was the good carrot to use. Um, but there were diff difficult conditions placed on you. Like, for instance, when you moved in, he asked you, if you want to be part of this family, not to see your mother for six months, <laughs> wasn't that? Yeah, that was really tough. Um, I had forgotten that, actually. I had forgotten about that. And I, so I called my mom, and I was like, why didn't we see each other for that time? Why, why when I ran into you, did I kind of run away? Because I wasn't allowed to be with her. Um, I think he wanted, things had been, and, and just to give more information about this, which you will find in the book. Um, <laughs> and I do hope you enjoy it. I mean, this is a tough part of the book, but there is so much, I think there's delight and pleasure and fun in this book too, I hope. Um, but, in, but this is a tough part. Um, I think uh, my mother and I had been getting in really horrible fights. And, and in some ways, this idea that I was moving over to my dad's house and wasn't allowed to see my mother, I think it was a little bit of a relief to us both, me and my mother. Um, that's true. It was also a very odd condition that I wasn't allowed to see my mother if I moved in with him, but I think he felt like he couldn't, he maybe couldn't parent me if I was always going back to my mother's house. And you have to remember, and I'm sure some people in this room have the experience of growing up with a single parent, single child of a single parent, single child of a single parent with no money. You are so close. Um, and I think 
perhaps he wanted that closeness to be interrupted a little bit, or he didn't feel like he could get a relationship with me. But um, anyway, that's a long answer. Yeah, there were some conditional things, and they were very painful. And yet, in the end, you want to emphasize the love you felt for him, not focus on the not good things. I think I just want to focus on the complexity of life and the up and down. And you, I couldn't really get all the great, I felt like I couldn't get the great stuff as great as it was unless I got the bad stuff as bad as it was. And I'm basically trying to get you to the point where you emotionally understand why I was, why I kept trying and why at certain points I gave up and why, um, why in elementary school I'm like using my father to try to feel cool. You know, I'm just trying to get you to live me a little. And that means it's, I think that's why I'm pushing back on the bad stuff is because there's really bad stuff and there's really good stuff and I just don't want either one of them to get short shrift. Which is true, I think, in everyone's life. I hope, I mean I hope about the good part. <laughs> We've all got a balance, but we don't all have had your father as our father. So it's a universal story and a singular story. And I do hope you will all read the book and you can buy it in the lobby if you don't have it already. And she'll will ha be happy to sign it for you. So thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.